Hello and welcome to the newest episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and I'm here with another fantastic guest this week. There are not a lot of people that I would be willing to get up at 4.30 in the morning to talk to. That's not true. I probably would talk to just about anybody. But in this case, I was happy to do it. Uh, I was very excited. This was my first chance meeting Rodimus, and he is just a dynamic guy, very talented actor, uh, really cool. You just kind of can't help but to want him to succeed within like 10 seconds of talking to him. And uh, we have a great conversation about quite a bit of things. He was uh, in the original Kung Fu series on television with David Carradine. And there have been several attempts to revive this show. There's another attempt coming on the CW as well as a film that is in development. And we're going to talk about that as well as his time on some other shows that he was on. And, uh, you know, he's got some great life philosophies along the way. He's got a really good attitude. And those are the kind of people that you just want to see them succeed. And I hope that he just continues along his path because uh, he's a great guy. So before, uh, you know, before we talk to him, what is going on here? I don't know. I, I'm hard at work on the new album and uh, the album is going to feature uh, the first song that I wrote that was ever on the radio called Dreamscape, which was the one that started me on the uh, the sort of new age music path uh, along with, you know, all the other stuff I do. But But this was the really the starting point for me writing new age music um very heavily heavy, heavily influenced by Patrick O'Hearn who was uh the bass player in Missing Persons in the 80s uh he just started doing some really really brilliant instrumental music and uh I really really fell in love with that as well as uh you know guys like Michael Hedges who were out there doing some really interesting stuff a lot of the artists that uh, ended up with private music uh, as a record company which is where I first heard him on a sampler uh, really, really helped me. I'm saying really, really a lot, really helped me down that path. And I love writing that kind of music. And then from that sort of instrumental music is what then, uh, created the mental sauna series. So, uh, that is where I'm going back to my roots for this album. A lot of songs that I wrote a long time ago that I have not had a chance to re-release. And, uh, so that is coming hopefully mid July. And the second song that I got on the radio is a single that I've been working on for a while, was the biggest pain in the ass to mix, I think, of any song I've ever mixed. And I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of songs I've mixed now, Um, but that uh, is scheduled for release on June 26th. So uh, keep an eye on my website for that. Also, uh, I'll be sending out an announcement to my mailing list. If you're not on my mailing list, please go to scotthaskin.com and sign up. It's that simple. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, I don't even send out a newsletter once a month. I mean to, I want to, and then I'll go, oh, wow, that was three months ago that I sent out my last newsletter. So it's not like you're going to get a whole ton of content from me. But when things are happening uh, that are, are vital, like new releases or uh, you know big deals, those things I will send out uh, an email blast for. Apart from that, I'm pretty much going to leave you alone. You're more than welcome to go to the website at scotthaskin.com and uh, peruse around. There's music, there's links to my books, there's, you know, stuff about the podcast, all kinds of stuff there. Uh, It's a veritable carnival of my creative history. So uh, that's pretty much what's going on here. Single album. Yeah. Uh, Book is still being worked on in the background, which I'm very excited about. Hope we're still hoping for the end of the year. uh, Although that is uh, somewhat tentative just because of the amount of projects that we're doing. I am uh, very excited, though, very excited to bring you my guest, and I hope you guys enjoyed last week's show where I had the pleasure of interviewing Loretta Swit. I know we didn't even get to talk about MASH, which was uh, something that I had a few questions on. I was curious, but she she did say she'd come back on the show, and I'm very excited about that. You know, the, the thing is, is that an hour seems like a long time. And when I'm at the beginning of a show, I'm like, okay, well, you know, we'll see how the conversation goes. You know, most of the people I know, and I'm like, I'm sure it'll go fine. And and it just, the hour goes so fast. And sometimes it turns into two hours or two and a half hours. But with uh, a lot of the people that I work with through their publicist, it's, it's going to be a scheduled amount of time. So I may only get a half hour or an hour with somebody. And, uh, you know, you want to be respectful. I could have talked to Loretta for probably a whole day. And uh, (laughs) that would have been fine. But uh, anyway, she'll be coming back on the show at some point. And I'm really uh, looking forward to that. But for now, I'm looking forward to you guys sitting in on my conversation with Rodimus Parra. But first, 
course, we have to do this first. Let's hear a word from our sponsor. MJ&J Farms would like to invite you to experience the power of full-spectrum CBD oil. MJ&J Farms sells high-quality, organic, full-spectrum CBD oil tincture. Our oil comes from high-quality hemp plants grown in northern Arizona. We're a small family farm, and we put our hearts into growing a quality product. We did everything by hand, planting, growing, harvesting, and milling. We were involved in every step of production, so we can guarantee the quality of our product. We chose to mix our extract with organic, cold-pressed hemp seed oil, grown and processed in Oregon. Once we had harvested our plants, we worked with local Arizona companies to create our CBD extract, and then to turn that extract into our full-spectrum CBD oil tincture. Our product is 100% American-made. Visit our website, mjjfarms.com, to get more information on the benefits of full-spectrum CBD oil, or to find out how you can speak with us directly to get all of your questions answered. MJ&J Farms. Quality from soil to oil. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to bring my guest on the show this week. He has had quite an amazing career, and he's going to talk about some very interesting things that are going on in the industry today. Let's bring him on. Rodimus Para. Rodimus, how are you? I'm I'm very well, thank you. It's an honor to be here on your show. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. You know, it's it's uh, interesting because when I bring a guest on, most of the guests are people that I know or have known for a while or or uh, have a, a history with. And uh, just talking to you before the show, I'm a big fan of you already. Oh, <laughs> that's very nice of you to say. Thank you. Sure, you have a great attitude on things. I'm really looking forward to getting into some of these things. But uh, one of the things that we're here to talk about is uh, to get your take on the revival of the Kung Fu series. Uh, What do you think it is that people find so endearing that they've tried to bring this back several times in both movie and television form? Why are we so attached to this? That's a great question. Um, Well, the DNA of the show, uh, I think that Kung Fu, uh, the original series, uh, was the first time that America had a chance to uh, witness uh, something that has taken place for centuries before, and that is the relationship of a teacher and student, a spiritual teacher and and their and their their student. Um, and because kung fu is not just a martial art, it's also a, a philosophy that is based on Lao Tzu and uh, Confucianism, Taoism. Uh, Western audiences got a chance to see a character practicing, putting into into daily use. In practical terms, these sort of principles that you read that have you know very flowery that have sort of poetry in them, but how do you make use of them in a day in your daily life? And this is what the character of Kwai Chang Kane did. He was in some pretty difficult situations, and he always tried to do the most good and leave the least amount of harm behind him as best he could. So that is a very attractive formula for. A, te- a television series, for starters, or any entertainment for that matter, um, and it's engrossing because all of us, on some level, want to do the best we can. Nobody wants to leave a mess behind them, unless you're just self-destructive and you know and have low, very low self-esteem and, and a lot of self-loathing. But other than that, the rest of us try our best. And this is a character who was also doing that, who had also had some incredible training behind him. So we got a chance to see him do amazing, make amazing choices and, and follow through in, in very effective ways. So uh, I think that's a, that's a very wa- watchable, a tr- you know, interesting, fascinating thing to, to be absorb yourself in for an hour. I think you absolutely nailed it right there. And I'll tell you why. When I think about what uh, our perception of martial arts were here in the States at that time, what we were seeing was mostly... Uh, revenge, brutality, uh, I have to get even for my family, more a perception of what we thought it was. And when you watch a Bruce Lee movie, you get inflections of what you're talking about. You get a little bit of the spiritual side, a little bit of that. But what you get mostly is a revenge story, which I found very interesting because Bruce was a very spiritual person, uh, very nonviolent. 
But I think we really didn't get that from his movies. I think we got that more from Kung Fu. Indeed. Uh, that's another reason why I'm so sad that Quentin Tarantino, uh, in his recent film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, chose to depict Bruce Lee in a very two-dimensional way that just served the purpose of his script and not really the legacy of, of the man himself. He was an amazing human being who did a lot of, you know, taught, taught a lot of people some very profound things. And like, for example, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, to this day, you know, credits much of his spiritual growth to having been a student of uh, Bruce Lee's. So, so yes, I agree with you. Yeah, and, and uh, Kareem's scene in Game of Death was just, it was such an amazing thing. I've never seen such a David and Goliath story, stories told so well in a couple of minutes. Well, there you go. <laughs> I was going to say, well, if it hadn't been for or the the TV series coming into existence, Bruce Lee would not have gone to China to make his movies. Uh, once he was sort of, well, not sort of, once he was directly rejected by ABC uh, as being somebody who they felt would not be able to carry a, a TV show um, for whatever reasons they had, he said, well, okay, you know what? That's it. I'm, I'm tired of beating on this wall of Hollywood. I'm going to go to China where I've had offers for years. And I'm going to make my movies. And it's because he did that and came back at the same time that the TV show was hitting, that his movies were hitting the movie theaters, that, that one-two punch, no, no pun intended, <laughs> was, what, um, was what created the whole kung fu craze. And it was started by, you know, this simple story of this Shaolin priest walking the West. I think David Carradine was such a great uh, choice for that. I don't know who else had been considered for the role, but he just has a very... Uh, Zen way about him in this show that really made him perfect for that character. What what was your feeling when you were on set uh, shooting? Now, of course, you're playing the young version of him, so you're not working directly with him in the scenes, but certainly you had spent time with him. Oh, yes, yes. No, I was fascinated by him. I mean, uh, as it happens, um, my mother knew him briefly when the two of them were, were actually scouted off the New York stage where they were working in 1963, by Universal Studios scouts who then invited them to come to Los Angeles to do a test, like a screen test, for uh, to be possibly uh, contract players in the studio system, the last days of the, the waning studio system where each big, big studio had a group of actors that, that would be under contract to them that they would be able to bring in and use for various uh, performances in both feature films and, and their television shows. So the two of them shared the same airplane and, and stayed at the same hotel. And we're part of that. And so when uh, years later, uh, when uh, I was cast and my mom said, so, OK, so who's playing the adult Kane in this? And they said, oh, um, David Carradine. And she said, oh, David Carradine. <laughs> and, and they went, oh, do you know David? And she said, I know where he lives. <laughs> and they were like, oh, OK, OK, OK. Well, that's great, Lisa. Anyway, so the point is, she, she did not have a very favorable opinion of him, uh, which only made him more fascinating to me, uh, because, you know, here's a guy who's playing me as, my, you know, my older self, as it were, and my mom kind of thinks he's weird, doesn't want me to talk to him. I better find out who he is, you know? Right. So um, as a you know, 12-year-old, 13-year-old boy, I was fascinated by him. And he was a very interesting person. Uh, he was very... Um, you know, I think there's a, I don't know which uh, which philosophical system it has it, there's, there's a different types of people. There was a, there's a type of person called a trickster. He was, he's very much the trickster or the fool. Um, he, in fact, his license plate on his car back in the 70s said F-O-O-L on it. Um, that's what he drove around Hollywood. Wow. Um, yeah, he, um, he was, huh, you know, he, he was a, he was a very conflicted person. Here he was uh, trying to be a cu countercultural guy, uh, you know, and at the same time he was under contract to a multinational corporation. So definitely a conflict right there. And, um, you know, he both loved the fame and rejected it at the same time. And yet, it, and then he sort of kept that kind of rather conflicted view, I think, throughout most of his life. He was most accessible as a person, as a friend. Uh, which I tried to pursue friendship with him when he was not working, when there was nothing on the horizon for him, he was available. And when suddenly he got some gig, he was suddenly just unavailable, aloof, and, and uh, didn't want to talk to you for returning your, your call. So, um, yeah, um, he was pushing on the edge all the time of, with people, uh, pushing 
things in people's faces, you know, kind of stuff. Um, and the living on that edge is where he ended up leaving the planet too. So there you go. It's, it's really uh, interesting to find people that are so tunnel vision. And I know that there's actors that, uh, to, to do the roles, they believe that they really need to isolate themselves, especially depending on the type of role. Um, but, uh, it's, it's tough when you're a friend of that person and everything's going great and you're talking and all of a sudden they're like, Oh, I have to go do something. And then they just disappear out of your life for six months while they're shooting a film. Right. Uh, but was he a, a mentor to you? Uh, would you say when you were working together? Um, no, he did not. He did not assume that position, uh, with me. I did not ask for that either. We just kind of I think what we ended up doing was just kind of getting a feel for one another. You know, he liked me. I know he liked me because, like I said, we, we were still interested in, in, he was still interested in being a friend uh, or, or need to contact of mine as an adult when I also had a, an adult relationship with him. But um, at the time, you know, I mean, he once, uh, well, okay. You know, <laughs> I, he set the tone one time in a way that, you know, was difficult to overcome, which, uh, which was that you know we we were we were at the party celebrating the um, success of the series of uh, the, the pilot still you know becoming a series and there was a, a nice party you know cast party crew party kind of thing and he he arrived there at the same moment that my mom and I arrived uh, together I was like 12 years old and he arrived with his then girlfriend Barbara Hershey Barbara Hershey Siegel for, for a brief period of time because of uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel being a popular spiritual book at the time so yes. mm -hmm. she adopted that name. And so they arrived, we were all arrived together, and they're carrying a tray of, of brownies. And so, um, of course, I love chocolate, and I, I go into the kitchen, and I grab a brownie off the tray, and then later on I find my way back into the kitchen to, to have another brownie. Uh, well, um, what was not told to me, because he was there, he, you know, gave me my first one, was that these were marijuana brownies, and, and he didn't tell me that until the end of the evening. Um, so I did not know what was happening to me that night. I was, uh, fortunately found my way over to a pinball machine at this, at the house of this, uh, wealthy, uh, playboy type guy who, whose house was, uh, party was at. And, uh, if it hadn't been for that pinball machine and uh, me having an interest in pinball at the time, I would probably not have known what to do with myself. Uh, that was my, that was my anchor for the night. And so as we were leaving, my mom and I, uh, he took me into the kitchen and said, Hey, Robin, you know, um, you know, those brownies you ate, I go, yeah, he goes, those are, those are marijuana brownies. I'm like, oh, because marijuana was like very evil, evil, dark thing that my mom was very down on. So, uh, yeah, but at least I had a reason for what was happening to me. And uh, I didn't tell my mom, of course. Um, uh, it was our secret, but it's just not something you want to do to a 12-year-old kid without, yeah. the, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, at all, <laughs> you know, and then to not tell me what was happening, you know, to not give me a, my choice. He didn't give me a choice. And that's kind of, you know, that's a little bit too playing with other people's lives in a sort of a mm, an un, uncaring, un, irresponsible way. And he had a lot of that. So, yeah, that's almost kind of a get in the back of the rickety van. There's a shiny new bike in it feel to it. And as somebody that you're going to be yeah. working with, that, that's a that's a not, not a good way to start a relationship. But I'm glad that things came together after that. Well, they did. They did. I mean, we, we had lunch one time on location uh, and he was he was eating his uh, macrobiotic food and he didn't know that I that I actually was raised in macrobiotics. So he was going to uh, try to fool me again. And he offered me an umeboshi and an umeboshi is a, is a Japanese salt plum. It looks like a little piece of dried, moist, dried fruit. Uh, but when you put it in your mouth, it's like incredibly salty. Ooh. So he said, here, try this. And I said, oh, umeboshi, no thanks. And he was like, oh, this kid knows what umeboshi is. <laughs> okay, okay. There's, there's more to him than, you know, I, I guess I can only fool him once, I guess. You know? <laughs> right. I, I had a similar experience the first time that I uh, went to a sushi restaurant. Uh, one of my friends that I went with, uh, I, I looked down at the plate and I said, hey, what is this uh, little green glob? And they said, oh, that's wasabi. And I said, oh, OK. And they said, you just you just take that and you pop it in your mouth. Oh, no. Oh, dear. That's terrible. I uh, I'm pretty sensitive to to heat and real spicy things. I'm not you know, a huge right. fan of them. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. I saw through time that day. <laughs> that was it was a little potent for what I was expecting.
Yeah, yeah. You had your sinuses. You had your sinuses cleaned out pretty well. I did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I could dear. I could understand uh, that. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to avoid that. But but who but who perpetrated that? The, the, someone who worked there or, or say, people you were with at the restaurant? No, it was it, it was my friend that I went to to lunch with. I see. And have you remained friends with that person? Surprisingly, yes. <laughs> Oh, well, good. Yeah, it was, it, you know, it's it's one thing when people do something to be mean. And I don't I, I know she didn't mean to be mean. It was all in good fun, but it was kind of mean. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they've tried to revive this show. There was another run, I think, in, in the, the 90s. Um, and now they're reviving it again. The CW is bringing Kung Fu back as a show. And there's also talk um, of a movie being in development. So it's it seems like we're. There's some part of this, and I think you're right on the spirituality side of it, but we're just not ready to let this go. Do you feel like this is the time for it? Well, yes. I mean, I don't think there ever isn't a time when you need some guidelines for how to uh, how to wade your wade your way through the the difficulties and challenges of life. I mean, I think that kind of advice is always um, useful. Um, you know, the Kung Fu gave rise to that relationship with the master, the master and student. It was then uh, brought to life again a few years later by, by George Lucas when he released Star Wars and the relationship between Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi and then eventually with Yoda. Um, as it happens, uh, George Lucas lived three doors down from me while I was starring in Kung Fu. Oh, wow. While he was, while he was writing the script for for uh, Star Wars. So I'm certain that he was a fan of, of Kung Fu because uh, if you look at the fact that uh, the character's named Luke Skywalker, the guy who played Master Poe was Key Luke and Grasshopper Skywalker. Uh, there's just a lot of parallels there. You know, and, uh, and the fact that his landlord, the person who was owned the house that he was renting a, a section of, it was like a duplex or triplex, was a very good friend of my mom's and mine and would always come over and visit with us three doors down and hang out and talk and stuff and then go back and he was a talky he's a talky kind of landlord um owner and 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 and, and his tenant was George Lucas and, and his wife Marcia. So anyway, uh I I know there's a connection there. And then of course the karate kid came after that. And then now of course the pan the Kung Fu Panda films, which by the way the character Kung Fu Panda, his name is Po, right? right. So, you know, there's there's definitely a DNA through line that started with the original show. So now is never a bad time to reintroduce these thoughts, these, these ways of, of being. I certainly hope that somehow these new characters that, that they, they're developing will use uh, the formula of reflecting on the kernels of wisdom to inform you before making a tough decision about something you have to do that seems inevitable in front of you, that life is presenting a circumstance. And how do you wade your way? How do you act with the least amount of harm, how do you how do you you know avoid causing a bigger problem? How do you get through it and with some wisdom, you know? And that's and this is why that formula is so powerful. So I just hope that they carry that forward. I hope so too. I I think the biggest fear I have whenever they try to do this stuff, especially when the people that were spearheading that mentality are not involved. Uh, is that it's going to be too much more Hollywood and not enough about that message. Uh -huh. You know, the, the thing that made it uh, appealing in the first place, it might get lost. I hope that's not the case. So I hope that they do it justice and that they bring that back. But you're right. We've been telling that same story over and over. And I just remembered there was a, uh, a, a series called Mortal Kombat Conquest, which was a television uh -huh. show. Uh, that also did that same thing, but they brought in the sort of Mortal Kombat mythology, and it was a lot more uh, ethereal than than that. But there was a lot of spirituality uh, shown in that as well. Okay, well, that's, unfortunately, that might have been during a time when I did not have or watch much television, so I did not, I was not exposed to that. I've heard people mention Mortal Kombat to me as being somewhere in this lineage, but I don't have personal knowledge about that to be able to talk about it, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that was probably the only connection was the television show because it was really about two brothers and one was, you know, the good guy and the other brother was the one that was always doing the wrong thing, but you could tell he had a good heart, you know, that kind of story. But there was a lot of oh. that, uh, you know, self-awareness uh, and uh, looking inward and um, trying to teach other people to do good which is what I think the connection is, aside from the fact that it's martial arts related. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
when I was studying martial arts, um, I studied a little bit of Taekwondo, uh, but I did a lot of Aikido, which is uh, 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 much more about, you know, internal. And I really find that fascinating about martial arts. And if you look at a lot of Bruce Lee's quotes, they really reflect that, even though, like I said, his movies don't. But when you were on set, was there was that just the story or was the set run that way where it was really about that same kind of um, let's support each other, let's uh, be there for each other, let's see what good we can do, or was it really just filming a television show? Well, um, every producer and uh, star of a show has the ability to, whether they exercise it or not, to influence the tone of the set. How does it feel on the set? Um, and Carradine did not play a proactive role, per se, in, in fostering that. He would just show up, oftentimes um, not having slept uh, the night before or not having bathed, but always knowing his lines. He, was, he, did, he never held up production on that account. But, you know, uh, Frank Westmore, the, the, the makeup man, would oftentimes, you know, go, make, a, make a gesture like, oh, my gosh, I have to work next to this guy? Oh, my gosh, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, because, because, Dave, because David was, you know, David would slept in his treehouse that night, you know, so, or not slept in his treehouse. Anyway, the point is, um, people set the tone. Uh, Robert Young, who was, uh, was uh, Marcus Welby, MD, he was very gracious to his guests. Uh, he made sure that that was a very well-mannered production and, you know, people were polite and kind to each other. You know, it was an older era, but that's what he did. He made sure that all his guests, the stars had their own chair with their name, you know, uh, uh, written on it and stuff like that. So, you know, that, those are the kinds of nice gestures that sometimes you would see in productions. And, and I think that persists to some, um, to some extent to this day, but on Kung Fu, Jerry Thorpe was the visionary behind that and Alex Beaton and the two of them were the producers and Jerry directed a lot of episodes. Um, and he knew that he was doing something innovative. There was a sense that we were, cre- we were, we were pushing into new territory in television, both visually and content-wise. And so he had a big ego. Uh, he clashed with David, but uh, he definitely, you know, set the tone for a very professionally run production. It had a lot of people doing their best work. You know, the set decorator uh, Hugh Laurie was uh, not Hugh Laurie. Um, um, uh, gosh, his first name I don't remember, but Laurier goes back to the history of Hollywood. The guy was an amazing uh, set designer, art director, and he did incredible work on the show. Uh, so there was uh, a very, uh, it, was a, it was like an experimental laboratory. But it, like you said, it was in fact another production which had a tight schedule, tight budget, you know, and uh, we had to get things done. It was Warner Brothers, you know, it was a mill, but we were doing groundbreaking work at the same time within the uh, limitations given to us by budget and time. So yes, both things were going on. David, uh, you know, David would do things like if a tour group came through, because Warner Brothers was, did VIP tours, not like Universal Studios with a tram, but a small groups of people would come by, and you know, David would lock them. He would do really weird things sometimes when they came by, like, you know, uh, relieve himself in their direction, okay, things like that, you know. So, um, you know, th- these are things that he did to just kind of thumb his nose at the stardom that was handed to him on a silver platter. And um, I just don't think he took responsibility for it as best he could have. That's my opinion. That's interesting. And, and, and it is tough because you have so many things going on and you want to focus on certain things. Other people want you to focus on other things. But I think if the, if the energy or the focus on set is in that direction, then that's going to show in the, uh, in the work as well. That's going to carry over to the mood that you're in when you go to record a scene or something. Right. Oh, absolutely. And then that will be felt by the audience. Absolutely. And Mike, Michael Landon was like that on Little House, too. I mean, he, he definitely, you know, demanded and got the best out of his people. And the same thing with Jerry Thorpe on the set of Kung Fu. Definitely. Now, I, uh, I find this interesting because if I understand the story right, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, with this new television revival on the CW, they have not shot the pilot, but they have gone ahead and greenlit a season based on the script alone. Right. Um, they, I think they're they're going to shoot the pilot. I think it'll be like the, you know the first episode, like an hour and a half episode, which mm-hmm. will be effectively the pilot. But rather than you know other shows that that put a pilot out to see what the reaction is before they commit to a series. In this case, the CW has gone ahead, gone ahead, like you said, and greenlighted an entire season. Whether I don't know how many episodes it's going to be, 
but they've gone ahead and done that instead of originally what they were going to do, which was just to run a pilot and see what people's reaction was. So they've gone, to, they've gone past that. Yes, they're going to, there's going to be a pilot and a first season automatically. Now, do you know if this was because of the uh, the delays in production because of the uh, coronavirus, or was this just something that they were they would do? I can't answer that with any authority. Um, my guess is only that it's only a guess that um, because of the possible challenges with there being an all Asian cast, mm-hmm. which is what this mostly is, um, that they would probably be better in a better position financially to produce a, a series and try to get the advertising dollars out of a series of one hour episodes than just what I, you know, committing, you know, all the production costs to a pilot and hiring actors and everything else just, and, you know, putting them under contract for a pilot rather than, uh, I think it was just maybe a better use of resources to, to do a, to do a, um, uh, an entire season. And then that way, that way it has a possibility of being renewed. Uh, but at least then they, they've made more money on it by set, doing several hours instead of just, Again, that that's purely conjecture on my part. Oh, understandable. Uh, and but I and I could see that strategy. And uh, of course, now because productions have been halted for so long, they have things now. They've like, well, we've got to get something going for when the new se- the season starts. But isn't that uh, kind of playing it a little bit dangerously because you're not really getting to see the chemistry of the actors that you've chosen? I mean, that's part of why you do a pilot. Well, yeah, <laughs> good point. Um, Maybe they feel like they have a, a good ensemble already together. Uh, again, I don't know the intricacies of, of that on a business level or or a creative level. Um, but you know, there there's definitely been there's definitely been some buzz about that. I think that uh, you know, with superheroes and all these various uh, you know these whole uh, family trees of superheroes that are exist now, I think it makes sense to bring back a character that had some real cachet and that does you know has persisted in the culture. But how are they going to work in the term grasshopper? I don't know how they're going to, uh, you know, uh, how they're going to uh, have scenes of a flashback nature uh, where where a person, a student is, is you know, being put in their place in a, in a healthy way uh, to learn what they need to learn. I mean, this character only goes in the modern show, the, only, the new series. This character only takes uh, only goes to China and studies at a Shaolin monastery for three years. She she goes there. She meets a female master and has a relationship uh, you know this teacher student relationship with her for three years and then leaves china goes back to san francisco uh to chinatown with her family and apparently her master is killed and she seeks revenge on on her master's killers uh which is not well (laughs) the only thing in common with the original series there is that her master is killed you know that's it right um the rest is completely made of whole cloth for this new new story so um i like i said i really hope they can pull it off and bring in some of those mystical elements because uh otherwise they're going to lose their, their all the people who love the original show yeah i that's kind of my uh the line that i'm walking with it too i i certainly will give it a chance and i want to be very open-minded but it's hard not to be a little bit skeptical when it seems like most things that are rebooted uh, do not have the original spirit, which is interesting because that's what made it popular. So why wouldn't you use the thing that made it popular as the anchor? Well, exactly, exactly. So, so you know, I had a very beautiful organic sequel concept that I actually have registered as a screenplay. Um, I did not try to shop it. Um, I, I tried to approach the original creator of the show who said, nope, I don't want to hear it because uh, I don't want to get involved in any lawsuits with you. I'm like, oh, okay, Ed, no problem. Wow. Um I have developed the character of Kwai Chang Kane into the future. Like, what would happen to him if, and um, and make me the future of his life, not in the future meaning like the legend continues where he's his own grandson. Not, I'm talking about in the West. What happens to Kane a few years later? What was his, what would his life be like? And I have a very interesting premise, and I think would make a fascinating uh, either one-off movie or series. There's a there's a there's a built-in possibility for a series with this with this concept that I came up with, um, and that to me would make much more sense uh, to do a reboot of, um, of course, I'm not revealing the story details because I, sure. I don't, don't want to, you know, right. but, um, but that's, you know, I'm, no one consulted me. <laughs> I wish I, I wish <laughs> they would have, you know, I could have given them some gold, you know, <laughs> especially being the, the only remaining person that was involved with the original series. Right. 
Now, I have to ask you about this because I, you know, uh, being that my name is Scott, I have heard so many times over the course of my life, beam me up, Scotty, which one out of about every thousand times I hear it is funny. You have had a connection to the phrase grasshopper for so long. Is that something that you still smile when people reference it? Or are you like, oh, my God, if I hear that one more time? Well, yeah, that's a great question. I will be honest with you and tell you there was a long period of my life where I did roll my eyes. Um, but then I realized as I got older and wiser and more compassionate person that um, this was a moment for those people to enjoy, you know, mm -hmm. and, and why would I why would I want to, you know, put a wet cloth on their on their amusement and enjoyment. So if they were getting a kick out of it, no pun intended, um, then um, then why not let them, you know, put their hand out and say, hey, snatch the pebble from my hand. Can you know, I mean, I, I define people who I meet into two categories by how they behave around that when they know when they find out about that part of my past. And those who immediately go to put their hand out and have me snatch the pebble are people who I consider to be less able to put themselves in another person's shoes mm -hmm. um, and those who and those who don't do that who just say oh how cool that you were that in that show that was such a great show are people who I find are able to uh, re realize that even if they might be thrilled by you know the, the fact that they're meeting somebody who's on this show that they like they are not exploiting that moment for their own personal uh, get off, you know, right. kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the difference being is that you were on Kung Fu and I was not on Star Trek. <laughs> well, well, maybe that too. Maybe that too. I mean, look, I am proud of the fact that I still hear references. I mean, I still hear people, you know, like, well, not John, well, John Stewart did it, but of course, uh, who is his successor now uh, in the U.S.? Um, I, I can't uh, I can't think of his, his name, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah, he's got a CBS talk show. Yeah, he he was a big fan of Kung Fu. He makes Grasshopper and references and stuff like that uh, on his show. There are still commercials that use that paradigm of, you know, ah, Grasshopper, you have much to learn. And, uh, well. So it's become a free floating meme in the culture. And, you know, I get it. I love that. I think that's kind of cool. Um, you know, so to this day, you know, now when I go to do autograph shows, which I've only done a very few of, um, and people come up and they're all excited and, you know, and they, you know, wanted me to sign something. I do this for them. It's not about me being, being uh, lauded and praised. It's about them having this great, you know, fun moment that they're finally meeting somebody who they watched on TV and it was important to them. I honor that. And I, and I give myself a moment to them so that they can have a positive experience in that moment. And so, so to me, it's a, it becomes a much more selfless act uh, of, of, of responding to that than it used to be. At one time, it wasn't fun, but I got over it. I think we all hit those ages where there's certain things that just because of the person that we are, or maybe because we've dealt with something so much, we just get tired of dealing with that. And I think it's a beautiful thing that that has endured because it's a testament to the connection that you guys created with your audience. But I think that that phrase has also taken on a life of its own uh, aside from the show. But the fact that, right. that uh, people have connected with it for still this many years uh, really says a lot about what you guys did. And you were also part of another show that has that uh, one of the most intense connections with its fans I've ever seen, which is Little House on the Prairie. Yeah, yeah. I know. Amazing. Two cult, two cult status shows for sure. Yeah. I mean, talking to Allison Arngrim, uh, who played Nellie Olson, she still does events where they they dress up in bonnets. She's reading the the story right now during the quarantine uh, chapter a day on Facebook. And, and the amount of people that have connected with that show is amazing. But we're talking about shows that had a very good message. They weren't afraid to deal with topics and issues that were difficult. But in the end, it was always about you can still be a good person. You can still put good into the world. I don't I don't really think we have as much of that today as we did back then. I don't either. Um, and, and because I think maybe some people believe that we've we're in a more cynical times and perhaps we are. Nonetheless, I think that the truth or at least uh, things that resonate with people's heart, uh, I don't think that I don't think that ever loses uh, luster. I think that those things are timeless and given half a chance, anybody who is exposed to something of that nature uh, will, will resonate with it. This is why we have, like I mentioned earlier, Star Wars, you know, why there is such a, you know, people don't just watch Star Wars just for the spaceships. They watch it for 
you know, the moment when Luke or whoever else, the, the Jedi Knight, uses the Force. You know, there's a spiritual element going on there. That if with if if Star Wars didn't have that in it, it would be a wasteland. Honestly, you know, right. <laughs> in my in my opinion. But that's the heart of the sh- of the of the of the show. It's this person who is connecting with an ancient tradition who is trying to put into 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 practice these principles there's a dark side there's someone who abused that power and there's also someone who is trying to do good with that power and the struggles that the trying to do good with it do like the latest iteration of, of Luke Skywalker's character you know he doesn't want to be a Jedi Knight anymore you know so um yeah that that's that's an element that in whenever an entertainment uh project uh is smart enough to tap into they will have people loving the show and watching it in a, a quasi-religious fashion because it speaks to them, and it's something that is desperately needed in the culture at this time. It's always needed in the culture, but now perhaps more than ever, with such divisions going on right now and uh, people not understanding what's happening around them, um, any voice that will pierce through the darkness and say, hey, here's something with some truth to it that you can relate to, I think people will gravitate to. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that we do need that more than ever right now because we do have such a separation in uh, in opinions, in, in politics, in uh, health, in all these different things that are going on in the world. We need something to anchor to that's going to be positive. And even if we have to go back to uh, what we grew up on to do that, uh, it, it doesn't matter. I think we just need something to kind of bring some calm to all of this. But uh, it's it's interesting now because we have so many things that are focused on the violence or mayhem, and they don't really have that message in them like we did back then. I think that's part of the biggest uh, disconnection in society is because what we're being provided doesn't have that anchor anymore. I think you're right, and this is why so many so much of society is truly adrift at the moment. But the, the silver lining, the silver lining on that is that you know when things do descend into this kind of desperate area. It means that people are going to be looking for a way out, for an anchor, for a line, for you know, for a life raft, a lifesaver, and and uh, so this will give rise to another another time of focus and redefining. Uh, so this is a breakdown that needs to happen for us to rebuild things. This is how I look at it. That's why I don't see this in a horrible, terrible way. I mean, yes, horrible, terrible things are happening at the moment, but in perspective, these are the machinations of a new culture that needs to emerge on the other side, and it will inevitably emerge, and there's no doubt about it. I, I agree with you. I'm more concerned about what it's going to take to get us there and what we have left by the time we get to that point. We have each other. We mm-hmm. have each other. That's what's left, is each other, you know? That's very true, and I think we can rebuild anything from that. If we have, if we work together, we can do anything. That's correct. But it takes us working together to get there. Right. <laughs> I, I want to sidestep a little bit and ask you, uh, because you've, uh, you've done some guest appearances on some shows. You were on Night Gallery. Yes. Yes. A very interesting episode. I loved that show. That was a really interesting show. Uh, a couple of interesting things about that. Do you have one more question, a specific question about that? Because I can tell you some couple of things about that that you might find interesting if you didn't already know. No, I, I didn't have a specific question. I just wondered what your experience was with that. Well, thanks. Yeah. So it was a it was a short a Conrad Aiken short story called Silent Snow, Secret Snow. Uh, and it was uh, one of the two paintings that uh, Rod Silling presented in his night gallery uh, evening broadcast. Um, and uh, it was about uh, a young man who lives in Southern California but he starts having fantasies about snow, and we don't understand why this whole fascination he has with snow. Now, this was written before we knew much about autism, and I think that maybe this character, uh, because it is played rather ambiguously, you don't know whether he's possessed, whether he's mentally ill, or what is going on, but there's this fascinating narration by Orson Welles, uh, which is the whole story behind how that happened, it's quite interesting, um, and uh, and this boy is in this, uh, you know, starts to just drift off into this other world of his own. And, um, yeah, so very, you know, creepy, interesting, beautiful, and at the same time, that same night, that same broadcast had another painting. And the other painting, oddly enough, this was before Kung Fu, by the way, mm-hmm. this other painting was called The Phantom Farmhouse. 
Phantom Farmhouse, starred David McCallum, who was previously from Man from Uncle, mm -hmm. and David Carradine, oh. playing a mystic, a mystic flute playing, flute playing, uh, treehouse dwelling <laughs> character, right? <laughs> so basically himself. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, interestingly enough, and I think that this reel, this, this this show was shown, you know, when they were his, David's agents were saying, you know, what about David Carradine for this Kwai Chang Kane character? They went and screened this reel uh, in, you know, at the studio for the producers, and they're, and they're sitting there watching this. They go, "Wow, well, that's interesting. David is definitely somebody we should consider." I, yeah, what's this other thing on the reel here? It's this uh, thing with Orson Welles narrating. Let's watch it. And it was it was Silence, No Secrets, No. And they went, "Oh my God, this kid." He's got the he's got the same kind of interesting mystical vibe going on. Let's bring him in too, and maybe we got a two for one deal here with David and then Rodimus. Wow. So I, I'm I'm convinced that that's probably what happened. Uh, I didn't know that or didn't put two and two together until many years later. But I believe that's kind of how I ended up getting in to read for the part. And um, yeah, but the narration of Silence No Secrets No was interesting because. Uh, uh, they sent the script to Orson Welles' office. They said, you know, Mr. Welles, you know, name your price. We really want you to do this. Uh, let us know where we can arrange to have this recorded, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, please get back to us. They heard nothing. They heard nothing back. They went and shot the show. Gene Kearney, the producer, director, he, he was uh, still hoping that he could get Orson to do it. But they heard nothing back. So they're getting close to air date. And they're, they're finishing editing the thing. And still nothing. So they're like, oh, gosh, we've got to get somebody else to do the narration. And like three days before air date, a manila envelope arrived on Gene Kearney's desk at Universal, and inside was nothing but a reel of magnetic tape and the entire narration that Orson did gratis because it ended up, we found out later, it was one of his favorite short stories, and he loved doing it. So they ran over to the editing suite and put it in, and they went on the air as, as they had originally hoped it would. I I don't even know what to say. I, I, that's <laughs> such a crazy thing. I mean, you, he yeah. knows that you've got deadlines. Um, I love that right. you just did it, but you know, call and say, "Hey, I, I'm going to do it." <laughs> you know, don't worry. Well, he was Orson Welles, of course. Right? You know? Yeah, but he. I mean, talk about one of the greatest voices in history. I mean, he just. He oh had my it. gosh! Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, someone recently told me that he did the trailer for the original Star Wars movie. That he he did he did the uh, voiceover for that. Oh, so. I didn't know that. I have. To, I'll have to yeah. see if I can find that. That'd be fun to hear. Yeah. 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 Now, now, I, I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, when you were on Kung Fu, did they shave your head or was that a headpiece? Uh, yeah, well, so the pilot, uh, which we really didn't know if it was going to be a series. It was just supposed to be a standalone movie. In fact, in fact, I wasn't even told it was going to be a pilot. I just thought it was a movie of the week. Mm -hmm. In it, in the script, there is a scene where the boy, after he's accepted into the monastery, he has his head shaved by another monk on camera. So I actually had to be in character and have my hair shaved off for the first time in my life at that age, uh, 11 and a half years old, 12 years old, and um, and there you have it. Now, the first season, I said, no way, no how, because I had to go back to school, right, with a bald head. Now, in 1972, there were only two different types of kids with bald heads, one who were unfortunately recovering or suffering from cancer, mm -hmm. and the other ones had a bad case of head lice, oh, right? Right, yeah. So, so I, was, I, I was in the third category, star of a hit television show. So by, so, so by, by the, uh, by the first season, I, I said, no. And I wore the skull cap, which is very, very uncomfortable. Uh, it caused a lot of, you know, it was painful. It, I couldn't turn my neck. I acted very stiffly as a result of it. And so by the second season, they convinced me, Hey, Rodimus, your, your, your performance will be so much more naturalistic. If you just shave your head again, I'm like, uh, I don't want to do that. I go, but you know, it'll be really good for you. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it course they were saving themselves two hours of my time on the set which is that when you're a child actor you can only be on the set for eight hours so right. two hours in makeup three hours of school one hour for lunch that leaves them with two hours to be able to use me that day mm -hmm. well by, by having me shave my head they gained back two hours uh so they had me for four hours instead of just two so that was good for production it was unfortunately not so great to be in eighth grade with a bald head because yeah. all the kids in 1974 all the kids or 73 70, 73 and 374 uh, were um, were yeah, the shoulder. All the boys had shoulder length hair. They were all you know skateboarding and motor BMXing and stuff like that. And here I was with a shaved head. So that was really a dismal year of my life. I went to public school when I wasn't shooting. I only would work one or two days a week, and then I would go back to, to public school. And of course, gangs, the Crips and the Bloods, and they were all you know they were all starting up around then in the, in the mid early 70s. And 
So there were a lot of young, you know, junior high school boys who wanted to show their worth. And I had my life threatened, you know, more than once. I had to leave. I had to leave school a few minutes early. I had to either ask permission from teachers who didn't want to give me permission to leave their class because of insurance reasons. I had to, like, just basically run out of the class and hightail it up to the bus, uh, the public transportation, so I could get across Hollywood back home uh, before the, the bully of the school was out there, you know, gunning for me. So that was not a fun time. So by the third season, I, I was, I was said, nope, I'm not going to shave it again, and I wore a skull cap for the, for the third season. Yeah, I can't blame you. That had to be, I mean, it's such a difficult age anyway with, with social aspects right. and trying to figure out who you are and how you fit into the world and all that. And then, you know, right. switching from school to going and, and working at that age, which a lot of people don't have that discipline. Uh, man, that's that's not fun. I'm glad you you found yep. some ways to get through that. <laughs> well, it was not easy, um, really. I mean, if, if it hadn't been for my love of filmmaking and going to... Um going to uh, the Barnesdall Junior Art Center and picking up a Super 8 camera a couple of days a week and making my own little short films, uh, I don't know what else I would have done to, to really get through that. Now, of course, maybe listening to Super Tramp, I think at that point, really helped me a lot. Uh, yes. And escaping into music. I really, really loved uh, some of that real transportive album rock stuff, Pink Floyd and things like that. Those were like you know headphones on, and I am in another peaceful, cool world where I don't have to deal with the pressures of that my mom is putting on me, that my career is putting on me, that my peers are putting on me. Um, yeah, so that was part of my escape. Yeah, and what a great time in music that was. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. I just have a couple more questions for you. Um, what were your, what was your experience on Family Affair? <laughs> that was one of my favorite shows growing up. Yeah, that was a fun show. Um well, I'm still friends with uh, Ro- uh, Johnny Whitaker to this day. Um, uh, of course, Anissa Jones, unfortunately, met an early uh, tragic death from drugs. Um, but uh, working on the show was uh, Kathy Garver. I actually, last 4th of July, I was with Kathy Garver oh. and some other friends. Yeah, so uh, hanging out with her at, at Darby Hinton's house, actually, for the 4th of July. That was a lot of fun. That was the last time I was in the U.S. Was a year ago. Um, and um, so, yeah, you know, it was fun because it was one of the first TV shows I did, it was like in the first handful of, of TV things I did after my first movie. Um, and I got to work with other kids uh, who were, these guys were stars. I was just a guest star on their show, so I didn't have a sense of anything, any accomplishment of mine. I was very grateful that they were so nice to me and, and had me on their show. So it was fun. You know, being a kid, when you're, when you're a young kid in the business, um, it's fun because you're, you know, you don't have the pressures of a career. You are just uh, going on interviews and doing your best, and then if you get a job and you get all this approval from adults, and it feels great, you know, it's a it's a fun thing to do. Um, it's not necessarily uh, the most uh, accurate way to have a childhood experience because you're having to objectify being a child for the purposes of performance, right. uh, which because it is its own it has its own dark side. Uh, you know, you don't really get to enjoy living as a child subjectively. It's a very uh, objective experience at that point, which can cause its own uh, issues. Um, but it is a lot of fun being in the professional world and, and being, uh, considered uh, a peer of, of these people you're acting with. You don't realize that at the time, but you are, you're being treated as an equal and that that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I love that you just were a guest on their show, but you guys really built a bond to be in touch all these years. It was, it was a little more than just, just being a guest. Right. I mean, frankly, we reconnected in uh, the mid nineties when uh, Paul Peterson uh, actually had put together a group of uh, a group, uh, an advocacy group for child actors called a minor consideration. And he was dedicated to being available, uh, having a group of people available to other child actors who might be struggling with their situation, who's either, who were either being exploited by their parents, which happens quite a lot, even to this day, or who were just, you know, not able to emotionally handle it. And, and we're, you know, we're succumbing to the pressures, uh, which, of which there are many, uh, even though, like I said, it seemed like a fun experience. The fact is, you're, you're a kid and you're on a set with, uh, you know, money rolling through the camera and, and time. And when you make a mistake on the set of a film, if you flub a line, a big red light goes off, a buzzer goes off, someone yells, cut, and 100 people are standing staring at you saying, ah, oh, you know, can you do it better next time? You know, kind of thing. And that's a lot of pressure on a young person. That, that's oh, not yeah. something that any young person should feel. I mean, you know, we've got pressures in school to, you know, pr- 
do our book reports, but you don't have a bunch of adults like breathing down your neck, you know, if you make a mistake. And that's a, whew, it, that's a lot of pressure. But again, you know, it's, comp- it's compensated for by all the attention and things like that. And then all of a sudden, like what happens with every former child actor, you're no longer a kid. And guess what? Hollywood is essentially done with you right. because of typecasting. Mm-hmm. You're, you, when you're not a kid, you're not a kid anymore. So, hey, we don't have any work for you. Well, that's a really weird thing to sort of have to figure out on your own that that's what's happening. You don't smell like Limburger cheese. You don't know why you're not getting the roles you used to get. Well, it's because you're not a kid anymore. And you're not even going, well, you're not going for the kid roles. Of course, that would be kind of silly. But, I mean, you're going for adult roles, and they don't want to see you because you were a child actor. It's very weird. Mm -hmm. So when that, all the attention stops and all of the lights go down and, you know, you pay your dues, you're, you're top of your game, but no one wants you, Oof, that's a really weird form of rejection to have to navigate your way through and not lose your lose your mind, you know, lose your you know, lose your sanity sure. because um, it's very weird. It's very and there's no there's no guidebooks for it, you know. Now with with the work that that uh, Paul Peterson has done and the work that he has fostered through the Actors Fund, which is a division of uh, the Screen Actors Guild, there's a there's something called um, the Looking Ahead program now that's available to kids. They can come in anonymously, meaning they don't have to have their parents to come in to get uh, psychological counseling, financial counseling, um, and peer peer support. There's actually groups of kids that they go out and do fun things together. That didn't exist in my day. That exists now, but you still have to have a parent who is at least willing to drive you there uh, to, to access that. And if the parent is in some way exploiting that kid, they will do whatever they can to keep that kid from having access to their peers, be able to compare notes and, and talk about what their experiences are. So there's still two camps, you know, going on simultaneously in the world, but at least there is this other thing that's available now that wasn't before. So we were all on our own as child actors, unless we had really good parents or really good friends or, you know, a whole family that could support us and, and see if we were still happy. Or did we still want to keep doing this or were we tired of it? Were we, were we not enjoying it anymore? You know, um, and unless you have a parent who's that aware, then you're going to have a kid who's going to go through some difficult times, as I did, you know. So. Sure. And and if they don't know the business, you know, if they just happen to be the parent of right. a child who, you know, uh, got caught in someone's eye, then they aren't going to be that kind of help. But was there no uh, agent or publicist or somebody on set to uh, to counsel or, or guide your career? They just really just left you to nothing? Unfortunately, yes, because, um, you know, it's it's uh, whose jurisdiction is that, you know? Yeah. Uh, who 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 is willing to cross the line of being a makeup person or a wardrobe person or a or a producer who is basically trying to get their stuff done? And you know, you're as long as you show up and you on time and you know your lines, that's all they really want from you, you know. And you perform, you you you, you know, you jump through the hoops and you cry on cue and whatever it is they want from you. Um, it's not incumbent on them to look out for your welfare. There is a teacher on the set who is a supposed to be looking out for the welfare, but what they're doing basically is making sure that they're not overworking the kid past the eight hours that they're supposed to be there, that they get their proper lunch, that they get their two 15-minute breaks. You know, that's what they're there for. And if they get their schooling, you know, if they have a, a, a curriculum that they're supposed to follow, they do that. As far as psychological counseling goes, yeah, unless they were, a, you know, exceptional person and they noticed that there was something going on between the parent and, and the kid and maybe took it upon themselves, which would be a great risk to risk that kind of input to a kid, you know, because what if the kid said, well, my teacher just told me that, you know, you should take me out to the park more often, mom, or something, you know, the parent would be like, fire that teacher, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, it, uh, movie sets, you know, it's tenuous. You show up and you do your best or you get fired, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, I, no, there was nothing like that at the time, unfortunately. Wow. And, and it certainly uh, kind of makes it a little more understandable looking at it in that light, why so many kids did end up uh, tragically ending their lives with drugs or something uh, in, in their life. Because if there was no one to guide them, this is not a, a normal life. It's Normal life is hard enough. Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore was an alcoholic at 13, 14 years old. OK. Yeah. So, you know, she was from a. A, you know, a royalty, Hollywood royalty, a name like, like Barrymore. And, you know, and she had to go through a very difficult gauntlet herself, you know. And it wasn't until years later that, you know, she sort of pulled out of it. And, and of course, now is, you know, very successful producer and stuff, you know, to her, to her 
credit. I mean, she's amazing. But you can count on one hand the people who made it through that gauntlet with successful adult careers. Jodie Foster, Jody Foster um, you know, um, Ricky Schroeder, but he was he disappeared for a number of years. He was gone for 10 years. Nobody knew where Ricky Schroeder was for right. a long time. Then he, then he came back and, you know, did it on his own terms. Uh, but very few continue with a sort of without uh, some big hiccup or completely disappearing from the scene. Ninety nine percent of the child actors you see on TV today will probably not have adult careers. However, that is slightly changing for two reasons. One is I mentioned before, there's more of a there's more knowledge about the pitfalls. And there's also a huge uh, publicity mill now around uh, around fame. So if you're successful as a child, you're going to be watched all the way through your you know, all through your growth. And if you want to take advantage of that, you can. And that back the time before then, before cable TV and all these other shows that focused on fame and stardom, uh, there was just nothing, you know, it was just a precipice and you either fell off of it or you, you built something else, uh, built your own bridge to something else, which is what I did in my twenties. I started my own business. Um, and it was very successful, uh, doing uh, something completely different with my life that I'm very proud of. It gave me a lot back, you know, uh, which was, um, I designed home theaters and sound systems, Oh. Starting in 1988, wow. yeah, and I ended up working, yeah, and I ended up doing like three homes for Johnny Depp and two homes for Nicolas Cage and Sharon Stone and Dwight Yoakam and Robert Downey Jr. I worked with these people in their homes and um, got a chance to see what it might have been like had I proceeded along the arc that I was expecting. And frankly, I think I dodged a bullet because those folks were living in a very tight bubble. Of, uh, and and had no private well very privacy came at a great cost let's say to to when you're that famous you know and you cannot go out in public just to go to the store or just go shopping or just you know, without being recognized and so you have to spend a lot of money to create uh, privacy for yourself and um, you have to have shredders and all your waste baskets because someone's gonna be looking through your trash every trash night yeah. and see if there's a prescription prescription or something there that they can go and run to the inquirer and sell. And uh, so, wow, what kind of a life is that? You know, it's not easy. And God bless the people who've made it through. And it's, it's fraught with problems and, and challenges that people don't realize. They go, well, you're a star. What are you complaining about? Uh, yeah, but I have, to go to a, I have to go buy an island somewhere in order to have a, a nice beach to, to relax on without being, without being pestered, you know. Right. Um, you know, so it's, everything is in perspective, and we don't, you know, we, there's such a cult of personality in, in, in the world right now that if you're a star, somehow you're just like, you're a god. Well, no, you're a human being who has every bit the same amount of emotions and everything else as the rest of us, but the fame has its own price, and you definitely pay a stiff price to, to be in that echelon. Absolutely. And I think it's it's fairly safe to say that it is the, the tabloids, but Hollywood and, and that that also causes that they've glamorized being an actor to the point where people are heralded almost as gods and right. or at least as close as we get. So it's like, I want to get popular. How do I do it? OK, well, you do this and this and this. Oh, OK, great. Now I'm popular. I'm getting a lot of roles, but I also had to give up my life to do it. Right. It's a big trade off. So be, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, <laughs> I am trying to get back in the business now uh, to do, to support my family because it's one of my skills. And now that I'm living in France, uh, you know my my options are rather limited without being fluent in French. So I'm going I'm going back to to get it back into into acting again. But I don't need or want to be a star. I just want to be a working actor, pay my bills, and enjoy a craft that I actually do have some skill with. Um, and now that I've retired from my other business that I did for 26 years, um, I, I have still some creativity left in me that I want to express through through writing and, and through acting. So I'm writing my memoirs, uh, and I'm and I'm you know looking for some some interesting little character roles to do. And if I could do a little string of those every year, I would be super happy, and my wife would be happy, and and my baby would be happy. So, well, I yeah. definitely would love to see you return to the screen. I think you're a very talented actor. I think that you have a great mindset, and I think that your energy and your focus would be something that I would welcome into any character that you would play, because those are the most enjoyable people. Oh, yeah, that is one of the nicest things uh, to hear. Thank you so much for saying that. I really really value that. And um, I, I certainly hope I get the opportunity to, to fulfill your interest there. <laughs> well, I'm sure you will. I, I feel it coming. I want to thank you thank so you. much for taking some time to come on the show. I really appreciate it. It's great to meet you. I'm really excited to see what happens to you next. 
Well, thanks. You you have made it a pleasure, and your thoughtfulness and your interesting questions and, and follow throughs are, have been most refreshing and enjoyable as well. So more power to you as well. Oh, thank you so much. Let's keep in touch and come back on the show when those memoirs are ready to go. Thank you. I would love to. Excellent. Well, you have a great day and we will talk again soon, my friend. All right. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Seriously, how can you not root for this guy? He's fantastic. Very intelligent, very kind, thoughtful, talented, You know, these are the kind of people that you want to hang out with. These are the kind of people that you want in your life and you want to see them succeed and you want to help do whatever you can to succeed. So I hope this interview helps. I certainly had a great time and uh, look forward to seeing what happens to Rodimus next. As for you guys, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, please feel free to write me at scott at scotthaskin.com. I don't always see the comments that uh, get associated with the episode because I don't have direct control of all of the sites that it goes out to. So thank you very, uh, thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next week with another episode. Cheers. Cheers.